Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor, and I'm a little late getting to my first video today, but it's not for lack of working. I have been working my butt off. I have found myself um, in a few different rabbit holes um, over the last, whatever, 24 hours. Wanted to start with this and let you know that on Link2 that they've sold out up or they had, they must have just added it. They sold out of Uphold. And then they must have just added some. When I when I set this video up, it was it said fully subscribed there, but now they added some more. And then they've got they they had they had sold out of Ripple at private equity. Then they added some more of that. And so um, I would imagine that these guys, uh, before you know it, will have will have sold out of all of it. We shall see. Go to linqto.com. It's for accredited investors. These guys are a sponsor, but I'm also a customer. Last thing I bought on the platform was Ripple Equity. Okay, now moving along, you gotta see this. Does everybody remember the the movie The Wolf of Wall Street? Makes me want to go watch the movie after seeing this tweet. Check this out. Jordan Belfort, who that movie was made because of, he says, I am a large holder of XRP, six figures. My TV guy thinks it's the best thing since sliced bread. So does the digital asset investor. Thinks it's going to $10,000. I hope he's right, but I'll settle for $10. Wow, what a tweet to come to come from that guy. I mean, this guy, um, he was, if you haven't ever seen that movie, you got to go see it. It's pretty wild. Okay, now this is interesting right here. The CFTC has come out and said that the, the guy, that uh, this Roston Benham, points to enforcement actions the agency's already talk, uh, taken, but he's basically coming out, he works for the CFTC, and he's coming out and saying, look, we should be the top cop in crypto. And, he's, and I think he said somewhere that 60% of crypto should be our commodities. You know what I think this is? What I think this is, is that the CFTC and the SEC have been in a power struggle, and the CFTC now is looking over and they're saying, you know what? The SEC is caught up in something that they can't get out of because it's based on things that are not true. And what, when I'm, what I'm referencing is you and me. The truths that, that we've been uncovering. And I was telling somebody, by the way, on the phone this morning, the effectiveness of what we've been able to do to expose the timelines and the truth of what has gone on with this Ethereum free pass at the expense of the rest of crypto, what we have laid out, could it, none of it could happen. It couldn't have been effective and it could not have, have happened unless we had one simple thing on our side. And this was is the SEC's Achilles heel. It's the people behind Ethereum's free pass. It's all of their Achilles heel. And that is, we have the truth on our side. And that's a hell of a thing to have. And, and you should all be proud of yourselves because all we did is we carried that baton of truth and went where it led us. And it led us to some interesting places and it continues to. And we will not stop exposing the truth until we get our level playing field for XRP. It's as simple as that. We're not going anywhere and there's thousands of us. We're decentralized, by the way, unlike Ethereum. All right, speaking of, so so I was going through the Ethereum book called The Infinite Machine by Camilla Russo, and I showed you this yesterday. And the guy I came upon upon that I had not that I didn't know about at the time, Stephen Naryoff, calls himself an ICO legal ar architect. He was one of the he's, he was the key legal advisor to Joseph Lubin and the Ethereum guys at the very, before they did the crowd sale. In fact, now I know what Joseph Lubin's piece of paper was. The piece of paper was this guy 
Um, this Stephen Naryoff, and you need to understand this. It's important because this guy, I believe, knows where all the, the bad stuff is. Stephen Naryoff is the legal architect, as he calls himself, but he was the one that went to the law firm that Ethereum used way back when prior Cashman. And he, and he got this other, and I know the attorney's name too. We'll get to those names later, but not in this video. Right now we're focused on this guy. And I laid out all, I laid out exactly what happened here and exactly how it all happened. But it's important. This guy's important. And so guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to find out more about him and find more video and things about this guy. We're going to get all the way down to the truth of this matter. If they, if they want Ethereum to get a free pass and have all these conflicts of interest, if they want to do the wrong thing that's not backed up by honesty, then we are going after the truth at every angle. And this is my angle this week or right now. This is the same, same guy. Early Ethereum advisor Stephen Naryoff arrested in alleged multi-million dollar cryptocurrency extortion scheme. This is as of, uh, I don't know how what's going on with this, but it's as of September 18th, 2019. And I said a few weeks ago, someone said to me, said to me, just look at what we have today that we didn't last week. This only gets worse. Boy, were they right. New rock uncovered, and this one gets interesting, folks. And this rock is called Stephen Naryoff. And this is Stephen Naryoff. And if you look at his LinkedIn page, and you go down, um, down to here, this is where he was with Ethereum, an ICO legal architect. Now, Joseph Lubin said they didn't do an ICO, but apparently, according to Stephen Naryoff, how can you be an He was the ICO, ICO legal architect at Ethereum, right? Okay, and by the way, they did their their uh, ICO in I believe July of 2014, and that these these are the dates that he was there. This is his Twitter handle. If you felt like going and asking him to um, answer any of these questions, maybe he would be willing to talk to some of us. Um, and here, Ripple Eye has already jumped on it, and here's a clip um, from the Charlie Shrim show, Untold Stories, with Stephen Naryoff. I think that's one of the things that, but the, but the basic concept, that legal construct, is what people then copied and pasted a thousand times, two thousand, five thousand times. Um, and in my opinion, I think I was very vocal with this at the peak, at the peak of the bull market. Um, people were abusing the hell out of it. They were using my legal analysis to actually sell a security. I. Did not believe if there was a security. I don't believe if there was a security. Is that been a security? Um, I believe Ethereum was a security from the beginning. I believe Ethereum is a security. I believe Ethereum 2.0 is about to be a security. And I believe this guy helped to create a word salad. Um, and then I think further word salads were done to create the Hinman speech that called it not a security. Decentralization or whatever. This is Stephen Naryoff as well. Listen to this. The problem that they had was really, actually, a really simple problem. How do we raise money in what was called a crowd sale at the time, the terminology keeps changing over the years, without going to prison? That was it. For themselves, right? Well, yeah, and I, for me too, at that point, yeah. Uh, I mean, no, 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 I'm saying, I'm saying but, but they, were, they wanted to do a crowd sale for Ethereum. Correct. They needed, we, we needed to raise money, uh, but they didn't know how to raise money because it was clear the concept of this being a security was already, but that wasn't, that's not new law. Like if you want to sell something and people had, you know, um, Kickstarter com uh, comparisons and other kind of crowd sale comparisons and there was the job that I had stuff. There was all kinds of different legislation that made it clear that this was dangerous area. Um, and so uh, I, I took it amongst myself, upon, upon myself, to figure out a way solely for the purpose of um, making the project happen, um, I, to find a way legally to get this done. And by legally, I meant really it was a structure that worked, uh, that was legally viable, and I believe we have maybe the only um, solid opinion 
Was that given out? So I don't think anybody's been thought about to probably give an opinion since then. Um, and so we, you know, we connected with a good law firm. Um, I think most of the research uh, was fortunate that, um, I don't know play what we did, but uh, there was a former um, chief of the SEC that I was in daily conversations with, and we realized that very quickly that we have these round pegs, um, these things called tokens. And the Securities Acts, you know, the 33 and the 34, the, the regulation of them, those, um, and, and other ones as have been talked about, um, uh, were the square hole. It, they just simply didn't fit. So we had to come up with some methodology that made um, sense. Okay. So there you have it. It was word salad. That's all it was. Now, uh, Bank XRP, listen to this, folks. This is Sandy Young from Ripple. I think in, in a world like that, what will increasingly gain more importance is interoperability, essentially. Uh, and that's one of the things we're, you know, heavily investing in at Ripple as well. Um, you know, we have created a private version of our of the XRP ledger, which allows uh, central banks to kind of issue um, the, the CD, CBDCs uh, and manage them. And we see that the sort of digital asset XRP to act as a bridge currency um, to to allow this interoperability and liquidity across all sorts of these kind of, let's say, digital assets and fiat um, across the world. So I think, yeah, again, I think the regulation policy should create that environment where all of these coexist and um, give people, people and businesses choice to use the, the right one for the right purpose. I think in, in a okay. world like that, what... That's interesting stuff. Now, um, let's go to this. Uh, I put this video together today. This is from 1-7-2018. And make no mistake, folks, this is the this is the real deal, Holyfield. This was all planned. The Ethereum free pass with the SEC was just part. Okay, it was just part of it. Uh, along with this plan, and, and this is the key. Bitcoin, for, for years now, while I've been doing this channel, it, I've always been scratching my head saying, why are these guys talking about Bitcoin and Ethereum and this proof of work? as if it's something. They know that it's technologically behind XRP and a lot of this other stuff like Cardano. They know it. But they had a media, and they didn't just have a media, they had certain key uh, crypto figures that every time they needed them, they would send them on to CNBC or wherever they needed them to say whatever they needed them to say. And I know the names, I won't name, I won't name them here. but. It, it was they had to have the the media working in conjunction with them to sell the lie that is pr the proof of work narrative they had to this is from the 7th of january 2018. ethereum's rapid ascent has eclipsed ripple now which dropped about 20. okay so they do a big piece on how great ethereum is then they follow that with a with with ripple goes bust on the screen and the only what they're referring to is ripple's price tanked in 2018 in early january and the reason it tanked is because whoever owned coin market cap at the time and that'd be an interesting this person's the next person i need to look into because I, everybody always thought that that was done intentionally to tank the price of xrp and if I'm, if, if you want somewhere interesting to look, we always, what they did is they, uh, overnight while everybody was asleep, the XRP price had been surging. And overnight while everyone was asleep, they, they stopped figuring in the Korean markets, which people were buying XRP like crazy over there. They took that out of the calculation on coin market cap. So when everybody woke up in the United States, the next morning, they thought the price had tanked. And so it triggered a sell off. Okay, that's what he's talking about. But he says Ripple, the, the thing they have underneath this is Ripple goes bust. And then right after this, they put that Stephen Neryoff guy on to talk about how great Ethereum is. This all has been coordinated, folks. Percent at one point to third place today. What happened? It's not quite clear here, but Ripple has said that its price fluctuation is due to coin market cap. This is a site that lists cryptocurrency values that is now, they say, excluding Korean exchanges from the pricing averages, not just for Ripple, but also for other cryptocurrencies as well. This is important because South Korea routinely accounts for 10% or more of Bitcoin trading and more sometimes of other currencies like Ripple. So South Korean officials have been cracking down recently. We've been talking about this. 
Recently, financial authorities on Monday there said they were inspecting six local banks that offer virtual currency accounts to institutions up and down every day with this. Melissa, back to you. Yeah. All right, Bob, thanks for keeping an eye on it for us. Bob Pisani at the NYSE. So what is the future for Ethereum? Let's ask the co-creator. So now they roll, they roll right into a puff piece on Ethereum and look at the title here. Ethereum, a must own coin? In other words, ripples this pile of garbage because, oh, it just, it just tanked. Look at that. And now they have someone under, oh, Ethereum's a must own coin? You think this stuff isn't done intentionally? Folks, and remember, these people right here, these same people, as I sit here, it's not them covering the Ethereum free pass and the Jay Clayton and the Bill Hinman and all the stuff we've been talking about. And we haven't been, these haven't been our opinions. We've been showing you facts and timelines and exactly what happened, who met with who, and what happened. That we've been showing you, that's all they had to show. They haven't shown any of it. The same people that were pulling this crap back back then, and have been and have er, who have they had on their shows? Who are the main guests they have on their shows? Every time the market, every time the Bitcoin goes up five percent, they've got Anthony Pompliano or Mike Novogratz, all these Bitcoin or Ethereum people. It's been like that for years now. Keep your eyes on this. Narioff, who joins us now on the phone, Stephen, welcome to Fast Money. Pleasure to have you with us. Hi, Amanda. Good to be here. Thank you. Uh, we've certainly seen a huge rise in the price of Ethereum, uh, the cryptocurrency. So what's your forecast for where it go? Uh, I think what, uh, what you're seeing with Ethereum is the uh, exponential increase in the number of projects that are being built on there. And I could see there's billions of dollars being poured into the ecosystem right now, maybe 10 times more projects this year than they were next year which uh, I think could lead easily to probably a tripling of the price from here before the end of the year. And a tripling would essentially mean that Ethereum would surpass Bitcoin in terms of total market cap, correct? Uh, that's, a very, that's very likely. Um, there could be what they... Okay, so anyway, my point here, it wasn't just the Ethereum free pass. They, Whoever's behind all this... It wasn't just to, to get the regulatory free pass. It was also a, a complicit media that was that was pumping this, has been pumping Bitcoin and Ethereum for years now. They did, th this was all done intentionally, folks. Do not underestimate what I'm telling you here. This has been done intentionally all the way around. Now, let me give you a little bit of irony here. Looks like Vitalik, this is, this is from that same book, The Infinite Machine, okay? This is Vitalik Buterin. Um, it says, he made his way to Ripple C CTO Stefan Thomas's studio apartment just south of Market Street, where he would stay for two weeks, eager to get to work. For about two weeks in late November, he only worked on Ether the Ethereum white paper, sometimes from Stefan's studio, sometimes from the Ripple office. Stefan was working on building a smart contracts layer for Ripple, which he didn't end up releasing and was excited to share his progress with Vitalik and hear about his experience working with MasterCoin and Colored Coins. But he was a little disappointed that Vitalik didn't talk much and kept mostly to himself. He lit looked, people. He lit, Vitalik Buterin literally wrote the Ethereum white paper in Stefan Thomas's studio apartment and Ripple's office. How about them apples? And then I want, I'm not going to play this video. This is that video of Joseph Lubin where he's talking about um, how um, this is where he's actually, I'm going to have to take one quick break here because um, actually I'll wait a second. So this is Joseph no, I'll, I'll, I'm going to stop. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there because very rarely do I do this, but I was craving barbecue and I didn't want to go out to eat. And so what I did was I ordered the from the waiter app, I ordered some barbecue for lunch. Very rarely do I order use the waiter app for lunch, um, but I did. And so the guy was at the door. That's what just happened right in the middle of this. Okay. So this clip that I'm not going to play, this was the Joseph Lubin clip where he's, where he uh, is further along in this clip. It's like in here, <laughs> this is where he was talking about helping whales to disguise their, their Ethereum purchases in the Ethereum sale. 
Um, so I went and I, I was looking around and I found this blog entry and you can go to my Twitter feed and you can see it. It's a, it's an article, a blog entry by Preston Byrne. It's called weather ether is a security from April 23rd, 2018. Well, this is the most interesting part of his blog. In my view, most of the Ether sold in 2000, the 2014 token presale in exchange for Bitcoin may have been paid out to one person or more likely a handful of close associates working in concert. My reasons for believing this are anecdotal, but based mainly on this chart, which shows the inflow of Bitcoin to the Ethereum wallet address during the Ethereum pre-sale. And he's got more here about his thinking. I don't know if he's right. I just think that this is fascinating and you should go and look into it. Okay. I saw this I Trust Capital. Uh, they had tweeted this uh, a, a happy customer. And I wanted to just show you this. They're talking about some some different companies they were with and they said many years i was with these companies many years before i found out i trust capital so i can say that i've tried the rest tried the rest and finally found the best marcello is awesome and if i could i could i would give i trust capital more than five stars they truly deserve it i highly recommend them as they have the lowest fees best customer service in the industry and they're always improving their products and services there is no comparison between i trust capital and the competition they have no competition as far as i'm concerned um, I agree. They're one of my sponsors. I'm a two-time customer. Um, I opened a couple of IRAs with these guys and look at all of the digital assets that you can purchase. And for those of you out there that have 401ks, if you got fired or left a job and you need to, that 401k, you need to roll it into um, an IRA, I trust capital. You can do that, all, all of it, or in part, you can roll an, uh, an IRA into um, an I trust capital, but it's not just digital assets. Check this out under their offering section, physical gold and silver digital ownership. They utilize vault chain investments, grade gold and silver held physically at Royal Canadian mint with ownership managed via a secure blockchain distributed ledger. How cool is that? I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, and tell your friends and family to go to itrustcapital.com and tell them the digital asset investor sent you. Thanks for listening.